if it were not for the headlines in the morning paper and the furor created by a decision of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian USA, Church USA. Today's first reading from the Bible would seem very out of place, very out of season. This portion of Exodus is usually read on Monday, Thursday, as the great three days of Easter are commencing. I associate this passage, of course, with the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night when he was betrayed, the Last Supper, we sometimes call it. That meal, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, was a Seder, a Passover meal. The bread and wine of what you and I call Holy Communion was originally part of that annual observance of Israel's escape from Egypt and her eventual entry into the Promised Land. The Lamb slain, the blood of the Lamb smeared upon the doorposts of the home so that the angel of death would pass over that home. The unleavened bread, the bitter herbs, the cup shared before and after the meal all of these are elements of that perpetual ordinance of Israel, the means by which the past is summoned into the present. As Jews recall, both their election to service and their liberation from slavery. We Christians read this story during Holy Week because, well, because it's our story too. We worship the same God as our Jewish brothers and sisters. The same God who promised Abraham that from his descendants a great nation would arise, a nation that would be a means of blessing for all nations. The same God who heard the cry of an oppressed people and sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. The same God invoked by Martin Luther King Jr. who stood with the prophets of old and declared in their words, let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. The same God who commands you and me to love God with heart, soul, mind and strength and neighbor as ourselves. The Passover and Exodus story is a Jewish story, but it is and always will be a shared story. By the grace of God in Jesus Christ, it is our story too. It is so much our story that Christians have adopted its most powerful imagery in our own worship of the triune God. When we gather round this table, we sing of Christ our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. We take the bread and the wine of the Seder and call upon the Holy Spirit to use that same bread and wine to convey the real presence of the risen Lord. Because it's our story, because you and I are we could say the beneficiaries of the story, it's easy to forget that there is more to this story than we are accustomed to acknowledge. When the children of Israel pass through the Red Sea with a wall of water on their left and on their right and arrive on the other shore with dry feet, we arrive with them and we are quick to join Miriam and her troop of dancers as they play their tambourines and say, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. But in the exuberance of that moment, we tend to ignore the bodies of Pharaoh's charioteers 
as they rise up from the bottom of the sea and litter the shore. All those bodies, sons to parents, husbands to wives, fathers to children, someone's loved ones, all those bodies drowned, apparently, by the hand of God. You could say it's their own fault. You could say that's what happens to oppressors. You could say that the lives of Egyptians don't matter much compared with the precious lives of our ancestors in the faith. But if you said that, I'd say you were not a very good scholar of the Bible. The truth is, other passages of the Bible portray a God who is just as concerned about dead Egyptians as he is about dead Israelites. Could it be that while we are dancing with Miriam and praising God for our liberation, God is in mourning with all those Egyptian mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, wives and orphans, for whom Israel's day of liberation is their day of disaster. Scripture prompts that question. There are so many passages in the Bible to support the affirmation that God, the God worshipped by Jews and Christians, is not in fact a tribal God, but is the God of all people and all nations. When you read beyond the Passover story and follow Israel's entry into the land of promise, it's, it's easy to forget that perspective because it's our story, because we share it. It's easy to forget that the promised land for our ancestors in the faith was home to the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The book of Joshua recounts, among other things, how hard it was to persuade those tribes living in the Promised Land that they needed to move over and make room for the people of Israel. What felt like migration to our ancestors felt like invasion to the ancient Canaanites and their neighbors. Exodus, for one, was isodes for the other, incoming for the other. The dark side of our shared narrative of liberation and exodus is the ethnic cleansing that went along with the conquest of the Promised Land. You can read all the gruesome details in your Bible. It is not a pretty picture. Without question, the sacred texts say that it was God's will for Israel to inhabit what we Christians now call the Holy Land. Let us call that the lesser narrative. The greater narrative concerns the will of God who loves the whole creation and all the peoples of the earth. It seems to me that we should read the Exodus story as a story of God's intention that all people should live in freedom and dignity, that no one, regardless of their ethnicity, should suffer oppression or slavery. The Exodus story should be a story shared not only by Jews and Christians, but also by any people longing to be free, whether in ancient Canaan or modern Israel. In the words of Rabbi Brant Rosen, I had to quote a rabbi named Brant. That's, that's great. <laughs> rabbi Rosen says, the op oppression of the Jewish people must be understood as inseparable from the oppression of all peoples. Likewise, the liberation of the Jewish people must be inextricably linked to the liberation of all peoples. Because it is God's will that all people should live in safety, God is just as concerned about Yazidis under attack 
by ISIS in Iraq as God is concerned about Christians under attack by that same group. God weeps for children killed by surgical strikes over the border from Israel into Gaza. And God weeps as well for children killed by the indifferent missiles of Hamas across the border in Israel. Last summer, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA attempted to make a clear statement about its opposition to the policies of the modern state of Israel. By a very close vote, the commissioners decided to divest from three U.S. companies whose products are used to build and maintain Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Only a few days later, war broke out between Hamas and Israel. At the very least, and not for the first time, Presbyterians' timing was terrible. When Christians in this country challenge the policies of the modern state of Israel, we would do well to remember the dark side of our own narrative. We of the doctrine of manifest destiny, we who slaughtered the Native Americans and had the temerity, who had the temerity to resist when we wanted to take their land. We of that slave gallery under which we sit each Lord's Day. We American Christians must be very careful when we dare to criticize others. We have not always stood on the moral high ground. Yet with Rabbi Romberg, Jack Romberg, I've decided I quote Jack Romberg. He's the only rabbi apart from Jesus whom I quote more often uh, in sermons. Jack and his Muslim friend Parwez Ahmed, when the missiles started flying, came together and penned a lament for peace. It appeared in the Huffington Post and in several other newspapers, including the Tallahassee Democrat. In their shared lament, Jack and Parvez acknowledged the differences that they have over the cause of the recent hostilities, but they agreed that neither side in the conflict is all good or all bad. They decried the violence on both sides and wrote, War is never holy. Perhaps sometimes war can be just, but there is nothing just about Hamas targeting Israeli civilians or the death of Palestinian children caused by Israeli bombardment. It seems to me both Jack and Parvez are reading from the greater narrative of their respective traditions. If you look for a tribal God who takes pleasure in the suffering of those who do not worship at his shrine, you will find that God. You'll find that God in the Bible. You'll find it in the Hebrew Bible. And you'll find it in the Quran. But taken on the whole, the God worshipped by Christians, Jews, and Muslims is not that God. When you and I gather around this table, we celebrate the new covenant established by Jesus Christ. That is not a covenant of condemnation and exclusion, but a covenant of grace and inclusion. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I are drawn into the embrace of that same God who heard the cry of those slaves in Egypt and set them free. The same God whose grace embraces Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female. The same God whose love knows no bounds. It is good to stand on the far side of the sea with dry feet. It is good to live in freedom and away from oppression. It is good to share 
the bread and wine of unmerited grace. These are God's gifts to us. Gifts that God wants us to share with all the world. Until all people stand on freedom's shore with us, the work of God's church, God's covenant people will not be complete. Until all rejoice in the goodness of God, the Exodus story continues. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.